Welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Sean O'Connor. I'm the lead application engineer at Bitly. It means I run the back end team. Uh, and this talk is called Failing with Grace, kind of talking about uh, dealing with failure in distributed systems. Uh, before I get into that, there's something a little awkward that I find it usually it's helpful to get out of the way when I give talks uh, and kind of demonstrate the point. Uh, so who here has heard of Bitly? I imagine by the nature of the talk, your, everybody's hands should be up. Awesome, cool. Who here has used Bitly in some way? Awesome still, lots of hands. Who has any clue how we make any money or have a business that supports 65 people's salaries? Right, cool. That's completely normal, hence the awkward slide. Right, you know, uh, and even more so from a technical perspective, right, like short links, really, like this is, this is ridiculous, right? This is just, this is child's play, right? I could literally, you could literally write a URL shortener before I'm done giving this talk, right? And even if you accept that uh, doing so at a large scale and in a highly available way, um, it's uh, is a non-trivial problem. Like, how on earth do you make money off of that? Like, who's going to pay for short links? Um, and the answer for us is really we kind of think of it as the power of the link, right? Like, the shortness still has value in some places, but as a practical means, isn't critical anymore. But if you think of links as kind of sensors and the thing that allows, particularly marketers, are our main focus, uh, people to learn more about how people are interacting with the content you share on the web, that's uh, kind of where we play. Uh, so some numbers to kind of talk about just the scope of problems that we're dealing with. So each month we see about uh, 863 million links created. Uh, we see about 2.4 billion cookies, uh, 1.4 billion of that are from mobile. Uh, just in case you haven't heard, mobile is kind of just the internet now. It's increasingly terrifying. Uh, and we see about 9.6 billion clicks a month. I think we actually got up to 10. I think these numbers are slightly a little old now. Uh, so certainly not Twitter or Facebook scale, but big enough for things to get complicated. Uh, and we do all that with about 400 servers. Actually, we managed to scale, get some efficiencies recently, so I think that's down to about 350. Uh, about 15 developers committing code every day, doing 20 plus deploys every day. Uh, so we keep on always shipping stuff, always moving. And we do that with 0% uh, downtime. Oh, I forgot to add my little animation. Anyway, with a couple asterisks. Uh, Barring a few DDoS attacks uh, about a year ago now. Uh, what was it? Uh, for most of the internet, uh, turns out when you have a global service, downtime becomes a very interesting question. Uh, similarly, for most values of down, which we'll get to. Um, so anyway, failure. Uh, things go wrong, and it gets, <laughs> it, it, it's a thing. Yeah, love that GIF. Um, Right? And particularly, uh, failure gets real interesting when you're dealing with distributed systems. Uh, Bitly, we love distributed systems. It's fundamental to how we do things. Uh, before we get into the failure bit, it's probably good to get a little bit of background on what do I mean when I say distributed systems. Here's a big old pile of text from the all-knowing thing of Wikipedia. Uh, I think it is actually attributed to distributed systems concepts in the design books, so maybe slightly more authoritative there. But if we dig into it real quick, a uh, distributed system is a software system in which components located on network computers communicate and coordinate their actions via messages, right? So you have computers talking to each other over a network, passing messages. The components interact with each other to achieve a common goal, right? So they're all working to some common end. They're not just like off, all doing their own thing, happen to be chatting to each other, they're trying to accomplish something together. And they have three significant characteristics. Uh, there's concurrency of components, right? So Part A isn't waiting for part B to do its job and then keep on going on like they're all working in parallel. There's lack of a global clock. Uh, this is actually kind of a fun physics problem. Uh, we'll get into it a little bit. Uh, but it's a kind of intrinsic to distributed systems. And you have independent failure components. Uh, if piece A fails and part B doesn't necessarily need to know about that, part B should keep on going on, right? Again, it's, these are just kind of basic characteristics that if you don't meet these criteria, then you're probably not actually a distributed system in any useful sense. Cool, so why do we actually want this, right? Like it sounds kind of complicated and kind of like a pain. Uh, and what it comes down to is it allows you to build faster, easier to scale, more robust services at a much lower cost than you would using other models. Or it just makes things flat out viable. Certain problems you just can't solve any other way computationally, at least practically speaking with today's technology. Um, cool, so we're on board. We're cool, we like distributed systems, we're on board. We bought our fancy new shiny computers, uh, and then something like this happens. We try and add one more piece, 
and then it all goes poorly. Oh, so sad. Um, this guy is Leslie Lamport. Uh, he's kind of a big deal with distributed systems. If you ever heard of this thing called Paxos, he was kind of involved in creating that. Um, and he has this amazing quote of, a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Right? This sounds terrifying. Why would you even get involved? Right? Or how do you even deal with a world where that, that could be the case? Right? Um, so from here, we're going to dig into some of the, the, the more, most common modes of failure we'll see and we'll have to deal with. And then we'll get into some of the kind of techniques and approaches that we have for, for dealing with and some tools that we've open sourced around that. So one major category of failures that you see in distributed systems is host failures, right? At the end of the day, your magical cloud of distributed magic is just computers that are boxes running somewhere, humming away in a data center, hopefully. Not under somebody's desk, but hey, if they're connected in messages, it's still a distributed system. Uh, and those kind of fall into two categories. Uh, one is uh, an easy kind of just flat out host failures, like complete host is gone, right? Like somebody pulled out the power cord, the EC2 instance blipped out of existence and went whatever those go to. Um, that sounds kind of horrible and hard because everything's gone away. But from a system design standpoint, it's relatively easy to deal with these because you actually know what happened, right? You just know the host is gone and you have to move on and deal with it. Uh, the harder situation to deal with and detect is degraded systems, right? Let's say you have a hard drive that's about to die that hasn't realized that it's going to die yet, so it's just kind of slow, but still kind of working. Or let's say uh, you're not using ECC RAM chips and you have a bad chip and it's just randomly flipping bits here and there, right? The system's still running, it still thinks it up, it thinks it's fine, but you're getting weird random errors that are hard to, to diagnose and track down. Um, those can get really bad. Um, another category of failures that you generally need to deal with in distributed systems is network partitions or general network failures, right? Uh, again, by definition, we have multiple computers talking over a network. Therefore, if the network stops working, it's going to be a problem. Uh, and similarly here, it breaks, these failures kind of break down into two categories. You have flat, like complete failures that are kind of easier to deal with, right? If your networking cable, if your ethernet cables look like this, things are not working and you know it, hopefully. Um, and you know what you need to do to fix it. Um, similarly, like, you know, your, your router just, you know, turns off and is never gonna, like the blue smoke comes out of it, right? It's just not gonna go on. On the other hand, you also can have these harder to deal with, harder to detect, intermittent, uh, or kind of partial failures, right? So some examples, again, would be like, uh, let's say you have some kind of component that's failing in some, or misconfigured in some way that's creating really high latency. Or, uh, oh, we had a really good one a while ago where um, uh, for a little while, so half a billion servers live in this um, kind of effectively managed data center. Um, and we have a standing Hadoop cluster there. And for a short period, basically running large scale Hadoop jobs would turn into a bitly off button. Because when we execute a job, half our network would just stop talking to the other half of the network for like 30 second intervals. Terrifying. <laughs> um, and at first we didn't even realize that was what was going on. But we, we kind of dug into it and what ended up happening was uh, there was some interaction between uh, the drivers on our NIC cards and the switches we were using where there's these packet flow, uh, pla ugh, packet flow control uh, or flow control packets, excuse me, there, ordering, it's important. Uh, flow control packets that basically are meant to be there to kind of provide rate limiting, but what they basically do is you send a magic packet and the switch can just turn off. And A, these were getting sent when we thought we were gonna have them turn off, but they were also somehow propagating to like the bridges between the switches, so like the entire links between the switches were just turning off. But intermittently when only certain magical conditions happened really intermittent, terrifying, hard to diagnose things. Uh, you pray that you don't have these. <laughs> um, and the last kind of major area that we're going to talk about as far as types of failures that can happen and how we, things we need to try and deal with is consistency in the distributed systems. Um, this kind of relates to uh, A, just the nature of having multiple machines, but it's also kind of like, so almost in a, uh, it's not an example because it's a defined characteristic. But that no global clock thing, uh, what that's about is 
if you have completely separate machines, by definition, they each have to have their own clocks. And the practical physical reality of clocks is funny in that, uh, at least the way they work in computers, right? It's just an oscillating crystal going back and forth. And little quirks like little fluctuations in currency, little quirks in the, the way that crystal is made, means that they vibrate at slightly different rates. And therefore, you, no two clock is ever going to actually think it's the same time. Uh, so having strong coordination between nodes or having uh, the same idea, like if you ask each computer what time it is, they're all going to have slightly different answers. Ideally, slightly different answers. It could be a lot worse. I'm going to kind of bypass that. Um, that's kind of an example there. Again, just because you have these physically separate boxes, it's impossible to always have, or it's extremely difficult to have a completely consistent picture because you're, you just have separate isolated worlds that have to do some coordination. That coordination can always fail. Um, no question, but why use wall clock instead of vector clock? Sure, we can. Again, this is highlighting the types of problems you need to deal with. That would be a way of dealing with one of those in some cases. <laughs> uh, but any kind of consistency, right? Like if you're, you're, let's say, writing information to two machines, right? And machine A thinks that a value is one and machine B thinks the value is two, that's a problem. That's a failure mode and you have to figure out how to deal with that, right? Uh, beyond this, there's a bunch of other kind of smaller, if you will, uh, categories of uh, failures that can happen in distributed systems that we're just not going to deal with. Um, kind of just sleep them on the rug and pretend they don't exist for the purpose of this talk. Uh, it's mostly just a matter of kind of time and clarity. That being said, if you're interested in talking about them, you have to talk to them. One of them would be that clock drift issue. It's, it's a pain, but it's a thing. Um, so at this point, now that we know all these horrible ways that things can go wrong, uh, we might want to just go home and say nope and not deal with it. And in some situations, you can and you should. If you can get away with having a system where you don't actually have to have some things be distributed, like let's say you can have all your system state in a single database server, do that. For the love of God, do that. Um, it's one of those things of like try to make it, try to be careful about picking what problems you have to solve. And depending on your problem space, like you might be able to adjust things so that you can do that. Uh, that being said, sometimes you can't. Uh, for example, if you uh, don't have all the money in the world and you're trying to deal with 10 billion clicks a month, probably not going to do that all on the machine. So we have to deal with this. So let's get into some of the ways that we try and deal with these types of failure. One of the big ones for us is uh, asynchronous queues. And particularly when we design interactions between systems, we generally think async is better than sync, except when it isn't. So we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, so what do I mean when I say it, async is better than sync? Or what, what do I mean even just when I say asynchronous communication? What I mean by that is uh, that ideally communication between systems should look more like letters in the mail or email than two people having a conversation. Right? And there's a lot you get from this. There's actually a ton you get from this beyond the purposes of failure, but we're going to focus on the failure modes. Um, one of the biggest ones you get is if something goes wrong, right? either the link between the systems fails, uh, you know, Party A and Party B, or one of the, pe the systems involved is unavailable, whatever, messages can just pile up and then you can process them later, right? If somebody, uh, you know, if you're, if you're having a conversation with somebody and the person you're talking to passes out, that conversation won't continue anymore, right? You, you just can't do anything until the person, you know, hopefully wakes up. Um, on the other hand, if you're having like a correspondence over the mail and somebody goes on vacation, it's OK, right? Like things maybe are a little bit slower, but the mail just piles up on their floor. And then when they get home, they can process through it and get reply to you. And it all just went fine. Um, and it is worth saying that all this, while this is great and this buys us a ton, it doesn't magically make our problems go away, right? At the end of the day, if a host failed, if drive's gone bad, whatever, we still have to eventually deal with the underlying problem. But helps us move the situation from a place where, oh my god, the world's on fire and we have no idea how we're going to get out of this to just like, it's cool. It's fine. You know, if a host fails, we'll get to it. But we got some time, right? It's all about buying some breathing room. Um, in particular, tooling-wise, uh, the way we do this is we built a system called NSQ. It's open source. Uh, architecturally, if you're, familiar, if you're familiar with something like uh, Kafka or, or Amazon Kinesis, it fits into a very similar place in your architecture. It makes some different trade-offs, which can be interesting. And I'd be happy to talk later about it. I'll be around the whole conference, so definitely feel free to chat. Otherwise, you can check out nsq.io. 
You can find docs, code, videos, uh, kind of pretty much whatever information you need there. Um, this is actually also probably one of our more substantial open source projects. At this point, I don't think there's probably at least two or three larger users of FinanceQ than Bitly does, and we were originally the developers of it. So, um, Something else that's worth mentioning about FinanceQ is that um, a lot of the techniques that we're going to be talking about, <coughs> aside from the overall kind of asynchronous messaging infrastructure, a lot of the techniques we're going to be talking about uh, in the rest of this talk are actually baked in and implemented in the clients for NSQ. Uh, so if you want to see some actual examples of this or just have something off the shelf that implements a lot of this, uh, you might want to go check out some of the NSQ clients. Uh, in particular, the most mature ones that have the most of this logic built in is the Python one, which you can find at github slash bitly NSQ and go, just because we're mostly a Python and Go shop. Uh, there are other clients out there, but these are just the examples I know that are robust. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's closer to Kafka. It bigger trade-offs, but we're different trade-offs. But yes, it's closer to that. Yeah. Uh, so aside from having that asynchronous messaging and letting things pile up, um, one of the next kind of major techniques that we use to deal with failures uh, is timeouts, right? And I'm not necessarily saying you know, hey process, you're being bad, go sit in the corner and think about what you've done, right? Um, but, um, oh, just give me a head a little bit. But actually just uh, making sure that any time that we're doing something that potentially could take an unbounded amount of time and setting a hard limit on just saying, if it's taking longer than this, I'm going to consider it failed, right? Uh, like I was saying, like let's say you have a, um, a disk that is about to fail, right? Or you're using Amazon EBS and you know your disk writes are going out over the network and things may take magically long times of <coughs> periods of time sometimes. Um, or if you're sending a message out over the network, right? A lot of times you can send out the message and may never actually get a reply. Um, it's really important to be able to set a boundary and say that um, anything beyond this time, even if I don't know that it's a failure, I'm just going to assume it's a failure and treat it as such. And the main reason that this is really critical is it prevents a lot of categories of errors from propagating throughout the system. We're having cascading effects throughout the system, right? If, let's say, I have a system that, uh, you know, I, let's say system A query system B and system B query system C. In the pro and, it, you know, it has to do that in that kind of order, right? So let's say system A sys queries system B and system B tries to query system C and it never gets a response. If that just sits around waiting for a response until the end of time. Now you have both system A and system B using up resources sitting around waiting for this response that's never going to come. On the other hand, if you have timeouts at both those levels, you still have a failure and you have to deal with that, but now you don't have this propagating kind of cascading collection of, of chide up resources ha that are sitting around of um, having things pile up. Um, Timeouts also can tie in uh, with another technique that uh, we're going to get to here. Uh, one quick note before we move on, though. Something else I would highlight with timeouts is uh, sometimes you can get away without getting too much into the details on this. But generally speaking, be sure you're aware of what exactly you're timing and timing out on. For example, if you're making an HTTP request, does the timeout that you're using include the time to do the DNS lookup for the name you're doing? Does it include the time to initiate the TCP connection? Or is it just the time to do the actual HTTP request and response, right? Those are all different phases that can each have their own failures and can each have their own weird timeouts. Uh, depending on the client you're using, they may provide different timeouts that care about those different levels. Usually, you can kind of get away with just doing whatever the defaults for a client is for something that's reasonably mature. But as you get into debugging issues, make sure you dig in and understand what exactly you're timing. Uh, we've run into some interesting issues where like, DNS acting weird has some surprising effects on client libraries. Uh, anyway, uh, so something else, another technique that we have, or that we use a lot to kind of deal with uh, failures and have the system kind of cope is retries, right? So um, pretty straightforward, if something goes wrong, a lot of times, you can just try again and see if it works. <laughs> um, when the pl this plays in with uh, timeouts, particularly in that, uh, let's say you're having an issue that's isolated to a single host, and you can retry other hosts. 
if you don't have a timeout set, you're just going to wait forever for this thing that's never going to come back. On the other hand, if you have uh, a strict timeout, you can just wait a little bit and then try something else, and it'll probably work, right? So it interacts in a fun way. Something to be careful about with retries, however, is you can very quickly get into like dogpile situations, where uh, let's say a system starts is overcapacity and starts to fall over, right? All of a sudden now you're going to be like your system is falling over because it has too much load, but then you're going to give more load with all the retries, and you're just going to be like you know just pummeling a dead horse, and it's just not going to go well. Um, so something that's an important complement to retries is a concept of uh, back pressure. Um, the way you can apply back pressure kind of varies with what you're doing. Um, one approach for back pressure is uh, if you're doing something request driven, like making an HTTP request to an API, there would be making, just delaying how long you, like waiting a little while before you make your next request. You know, like make a request, it fails, maybe wait a second. Make another request, that one fails. May wait two seconds, right? Like keep on increasing your, 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 the time you wait to retry to improve the odds that things will have gotten better by the time you try again. Um, additionally, with back pressure, it can be important to remember to, um, in addition to kind of like scaling up how, or, or getting more aggressive about backing off when things are going wrong, it, when things start to recover, it's usually a good idea to not instantly go back to 100%. Um, the reason for this being is like let's say uh, you know you have some service that you're querying and that service the host that it just runs on a single host the host died but you spun up a new host and it's back and it's ready to answer questions again but for whatever reason in the implementation of this thing it depends heavily on caching and since it just came up all the caches are cold so now if you just go back to 100% request volume it's just going to like get pummeled and fall over again and just end up in the cycle so you want to make sure that when you have back pressure, to usually you want to kind of ease it back on uh, evenly so, to allow things to kind of smooth out that, that initial hit. Um, another example of uh, how back pressure might be implemented is so like in MSQ, you're not doing requests, you're processing messages. So there it would be the client saying like, whoa, I can't handle that many messages right now. We just slow down and do it that way. So again, depends on what you're doing, but it's important. Um, right, and so I mentioned this a little bit before. Uh, but something that's worth getting into a bit more is uh, when you're doing retries, especially in a distributed system, it often makes sense to try and route around a failure, right? So if, in all likeliness, like let's say you have some kind of microservices set up and you have service A querying service B, in all likeliness, just if nothing else, nothing else for availability reasons, each service is probably composed of multiple physical hosts or virtual hosts or whatever, things you, you can query that are somewhat independent of each other. Um, Accordingly, when you retry, it usually makes sense to try a different host, just on the hope that it's gonna, the problem is isolated to a host and you can get around it. Um, this can be really nice in that uh, it really, again, moves a lot of problems from, oh my god, the world's on fire, to, oh yeah, we gotta take care of that, right? So again, like if you have a host failure or uh, a lot of kind of things that could become systemic issues if you weren't being smart about it, now just the system can, you know, it'll feel a bit of a bump, but it can basically cope with that localized failure and then just let you recoup that later. Um, particularly to implement this, we have a library that we uh, open source called Holspool. Uh, these are pretty straightforward, but it, you can kind of think of it as like an in-app load balancer that's really, really dumb. Uh, basically, you give the library like, here's all the hosts I could query for this operation. And then when you go to perform the operation, you say, give me a host, and you do your operation, and then you make a final call saying that whether the operation succeeded or failed. And it basically keeps in process uh, or in memory a bit of state information about what hosts are good, basically the success rates of the, the hosts, and will basically bias the probability of getting another host again based on the success and failure rates. So it basically handles that automatic, like, uh, you know, sending, sending the majority of requests to hosts that it thinks are healthy, and then, but still occasionally sending requests, requests to bad hosts so that um, when it does recover, it can just kind of just auto heal. It's nice. Um, another way people tend, some people will implement this is having actual load balancers between services. There's some interesting trade offs there. But um, so this is again uh, Python and Go versions. Uh, it can also be cool just to check it. Like these are seriously like maybe 200 lines of code each. Um, so they can just be good to check out. and from. 
Uh, it's also worth mentioning that NSQ, again, has a lot of this logic kind of built in for routing around uh, client failures um, and kind of distributing the load of messages to seemingly healthy clients. Uh, another technique that we rely really heavily on and are strong advocates for that also, much like the asynchronous SKUs thing, uh, has lots of other system design benefits, uh, but we're going to focus on the Gillen failure bits, is having immutable data, particularly uh, having the transport between systems be in the form of immutable data, but there can be other places where it pays off. So what do I mean by this? So immutable data is data that uh, basically doesn't change. Right? And it really depends on the problem space that you're solving of how you go about doing this. Um, but usually one of the more common ways that you're able to kind of translate uh, something into immutable data is to describe uh, basically your, the changes in your system as events, right? Just saying these are facts or these are things that happen as opposed to saying commands, right? And the reason for this is if you effectively describe everything as events, uh, again, lots of other system design benefits of like having better isolation and uh, 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 encapsulation. Uh, but particularly around failure, what ends up happening is if you describe everything as events and you just save that event stream off to disk, now you have this thing that you can just replay or reuse or so on. Um, while commands, that gets a lot harder to deal with because Instead of being able to say, hey, this is a thing that happened, and let whatever system's consuming that be smart about deciding whether or not it needs to care about that anymore, if it's a command, that gets a lot more complicated to try and work out, like, oh, did I already do this already? Or like, what does this mean in the context of, of recovery or something like that? Uh, <clears throat> one of the last, I think one of the last uh, kind of techniques that we uh, really kind of rely on is monitoring. And there's kind of a few aspects to that. Uh, one of the big ones for us is uh, having some kind of active monitoring. In our case, it's Nagios. Um, lots of tools out there. Nagios has the benefit of being incredibly battle tested, and lots of people out there are familiar with it. The downside is you need a very particular flavor of brain damage to fully understand Nagios, and until you've acquired that brain damage, it's a bit inscrutable. Um, that being said, again, very battle tested, works really well. Uh, this is literally the thing that wakes us up in the middle of the night. Uh, the most important thing about Nag something like Nagios or the role that it fills is there's something actively going out and checking and or expecting to get uh, reports in. And if it doesn't, if one of those fails, it actively reaches out and says, hey, a human being needs to go look at this, right? Um, uh, maybe. Actually, so the, this was actually funnier when the, the so I first gave this talk at Pi Gotham last year. And uh, this alert was, I think, 40 minutes before I gave the talk. Uh, so uh, there was that. Um, <clears throat> but the thing that's important about this is, especially once you get beyond, let's say, a handful of servers, it's really easy to have all kinds of things be broken and wrong and not know about it, right? If you have 400 servers, you're not logging into each one saying, hey, how you doing, buddy? Uh, it's just not going to happen. Um, there's a great quote that I wish I knew who to attribute it to, uh, but we, we really kind of live by is, uh, if there isn't an Agios check for it, it's almost certainly broken and you just don't know about it yet. Right? Unless there's something actively monitoring something and confirming that it's still OK and responsive and healthy, it's not good. Also, it's not just the number of hosts, it's the number of things on Right, the yes. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and you, you, to be fair, you can go overboard on this. Uh, noise becomes a major problem, and that is a whole talking to itself of deciding what to monitor and how to manage noise and how you go about that. That's a whole discipline unto itself. But still, you need this. Um, something else that we benefit a lot from is kind of passive uh, displays, kind of like information radiator kind of stuff. In this case, it happens to be a display of current Nagios alerts. Um, I think I have a picture someplace else of, of basically we also have a bunch of graphs. Um, but having this information around passively can help both A, provide a certain amount of redundancy, like let's say your Nagios server decides to stop talking to T-Mobile for six hours at a time. That's happened. Um, so having another place where you can go, oh, hey, look, stuff's broken. Didn't know that. We should look into that. Uh, it's helpful. Uh, it also can actually be an interesting thing for uh, the larger team 
this can be a good way of like, so this is just a screen that we have around our office showing this current state in audio stuff. Uh, and people who are not on call notice when it's all red or when it's all green, right? And it can be just help help to give some visibility to the to the people who, uh, by the nature of their jobs, like if everything's going well, nobody knows what they're doing. But. <laughs> so an interesting effect that uh, we've seen a lot, especially in social and mobile, is when you're monitoring the use of a system, mm -hmm. infrastructure failure looks exactly like interest drop off. Yes. So when something's going viral and then it levels off, if you're not monitoring the infrastructure, you figure, oh, okay, then that's as many people are interested in it. When in reality, a lot more people want to see it. It's just they're getting error messages so they're unable to connect. Yep. Uh, something else like that that we found kind of the flip side of that is uh, so a large portion of our traffic comes via Facebook. Uh, whenever Facebook has an average, we actually, our monitoring goes off saying like, oh my god, redirects are broken. Reality is just there was a huge traffic drop off because Facebook fell off the face of the planet. Um, it's a fun one. Um, another form of monitoring, which is really critical, is uh, logging. Um, monitoring is great. Yeah, random Flickr searches are fantastic ways to write talks. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, but uh, so logs are really critical. So it's really great to have something wake you up in the middle of the night and say, dear God, I'm broken. Please help me. Uh, once you actually wake up and start looking at it, though, it's not going to be usually not super helpful in figuring out what actually has gone wrong and how you fix it. Uh, logs are kind of where you need to have that information. Something else that's really critical with logging is having logs available in a centralized, searchable place. Uh, that can be something as simple as you know syslog going to a single box that you can SSH into and grep through, or something as fancy as Elk or Splunk if you have all the money. Um, but the thing that's critical about uh, having that centralized uh, searchable logging place for the logs is trying to do correlation across hosts. So let's say uh, you're in a scenario where uh, somebody can, or a particular type of request uh, causes an error that causes things to blow up for five seconds and then everything recovers, right? If those requests are getting spread across, let's say, 30 front end servers, it's going to be really hard to go into any individual server and figure out what's going on or what's the common theme between these errors. On the other hand, if you have all your logs going to one place, you can just search across all those servers, isolate the errors, and figure out what's going on independent of what the physical hosts were. Uh, again, super powerful. Uh, the last thing that we had kind of talked about this a little bit, uh, which is really important, is having trending and visualizations uh, for, kind of for uh, metrics. This is one of those things where so logs are great in that for getting really fine detailed information. They're really terrible at finding trending information, right? Uh, when you're just scanning, you know, if you open up a lo uh, an Nginx log file in, in less, and you're trying to go through and see like, OK, well, I'm seeing a 500 every so often. Is that just noise, or is that, oh my god, everything's broken, right? It's really kind of hard to tell from there. Obviously, there's some command line trips you can play. Um, to get that better, but really it's not the same as having this graph, right? So this graph I think is redirect traffic for us, broken down a bunch of different ways. This is going down, it's a problem, right? <laughs> uh, when those DDoS happened uh, and our primary data center got knocked off the face of the planet, the line just goes down to the bottom and it's flat. It's, you know it's broken. <laughs> uh, this can also be really helpful for uh, trying to, uh, another flavor of this that's really critical for us is, uh, so this particular is a UI called Grafana, which is a front end to Graphite. Uh, if you have anything in Graphite, I strongly recommend looking at Grafana. Graphite, I also find you require some brain damage to use properly, and Grafana helps a lot with that. Um, but uh, another one we have is uh, Munin. Uh, that just kind of collects a bunch of system health things. Again, stuff like uh, that like degrading disk uh, scenario, getting that out of logs is going to be kind of hard to figure out. But when you see like the I.O. stats from the system plummeting one day and then flattening out, you know something's probably up. Uh, so. Uh, I think, yeah, this is 12 hours maybe, but yeah, yeah just normal traffic fluctuations. Uh, so to recap, uh, distributed systems, we love them, uh, but there's some challenges you got to deal with. Uh, hosts fail, you got to deal with that. Uh, networks fail, you got to deal with that. Uh, and to do so, you want to try and make things asynchronous whenever you can. Uh, oh, I realized I skipped over something here. So remember how I said uh, async is better than sync except when it's not? I forgot to go over the except when it's not part. <laughs> so the case when it's not is when you really care about um, 
uh, basically latency or um, latency or consistency, right? So two prime examples for us. When you actually shorten something on bitly.com, the whole process of you pushing that, putting that message into the box down to the database, storing it, and then coming back with a short link, that's effectively from a system level and a synchronous process because A, we much rather give you um, an error than um, a short link that doesn't work. And B, it's really important that we don't give out the same short link to two people. It's kind of like crossing the streams, it's bad, things don't end well. Um, on the flip side, metrics is completely asynchronous, right? Our metric system having issues should never, ever, 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 ever impact redirects, right? So that's completely asynchronous. We don't even try sending the message to our metric system until after we've closed the HTTP response to the client. So kind of examples there. Anyway, sorry, wrapping up. Uh, networks fail, make things async, except when not. Uh, timeouts, they're important. Retry, but be smart about it. Uh, and monitor things. And that's what I got.